the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him. I am wisdom. Those who seek me shall find me. Welcome to Wisdom Seekers, an adventure into the mysteries of success. I'm your host, Carl Thomas, and it's my privilege to present a six video lesson series on the end time transfer of wealth. What is the end time transfer of wealth? Is it reality? Is it fiction? Or is it truth? Is it a figment of somebody's imagination? When God said in his word, the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just, did he mean it? Well, when is it laid up for the just? As we go through this six video lesson series, I want you to think of yourselves as the grand jury. I'm going to present information. You're going to make a decision whether that information is factual or not. Scripture says that no prophecy is of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they were moved the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to interpret the word of God for you. You're going to interpret it yourself. Because your relationship with God depends on your faith, not mine. My relationship with God depends on my faith, not yours. So it's not what I believe or teach. It's what you hear and believe. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as we present the word of God, you're going to make a determination as the grand jury if you can accept what I'm saying as fact and truth and faith. Now, in the six video lesson series, there are six written four page lesson guides. Please take out lesson number one. And for those of you watching this on video or TV, uh, I hope you have a lesson plan. You should have received the lesson plan with the video. Page one, the end time transfer of wealth. That's number one, the end time transfer of wealth. Now we're going to ask six questions as we go through this. Question number one is, what is it? Question number two, why a transfer? Lesson number three, when will it occur? Four, who'll take part in the transfer? Five, where will it occur? And five, how will it happen? Now Hosea 4.6 is a key because Hosea 4.6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. The word perish in Hebrew is the word fail. My people fail for lack of knowledge. The word perish there does not mean destruction, it simply means to fail. As we go through this, we're going to give you an outline of the entire 30 minute video as we start. And we're going to do the same thing in each video. If you want to find out about the end time transfer, you need to go back to the beginning. In the text, in your notes, it says, in the beginning, God gave man dominion over earth. God created the heavens and the earth. He then took man and gave man stewardship over earth. Now God had a plan. I don't think for one minute God just put man down here in the earth and said go to it. He didn't do that. Page two. In giving man dominion, at the top of the page it says dominion requires the mind of Christ. Now I want you to think of something as we go through this. Let's say that you started a business. 
and for 30 or 40 years you built that business. You know what it takes to run it. Run it. You've been running it for 40 years. You put certain principles, practice, and procedures in order when you establish the business. Now you want to take that business and turn it over to somebody. Let's take a comparative analogy. God created the heavens and the earth. He then gave men dominion over that earth. You built a business. You're going to give man dominion over your business. What kind of men do you want running your business? What kind of men does God want running his earth? Now stop and think about it. God doesn't have anything loose up here. His elevator goes to the top floor. Okay? We have to understand God had a plan. So if you're going to turn your business over to someone, you want someone to run that business with your mindset. Why? You built it. So what does God want? He wants the same thing. He wants the man who exercises dominion with the mindset of Christ. Does that make sense? Now at the top of page three. What is Christ's mind? You know what it is? It's to serve. He became a servant. He's the servant king. So what is God looking for in you and I? Same thing. If you had a business, you turn that business over to somebody, do you want them taking charge of it and forgetting about you altogether? No, you don't. You want them cutting you out? Or maybe just denying that you're the owner of that business and just deciding that you don't exist anymore and because you believe the owner doesn't exist, he doesn't exist. So therefore, you take control of the business and you try to run it the way you want. What's the owner going to do? What would you do if somebody did that to you? You're going to march right in, aren't you? Okay, now God's been long-suffering. Now, page four. Righteous service re preserves dominion. Okay, now, God created the heavens and the earth. You have a corporation. You built your corporation. God built earth. You want men with your mindset running your business. God wants men with Christ's mindset running his business. Now, what's the mind of Christ to serve? What should be the mind of the people that you place in charge of your business? To serve. Why? It's not theirs. It's yours. Now, what would happen? You know that if everybody in that business will work together, that business will be preserved and dominion will be established and peace and prosperity will be the result. Why? You know how the business operates. You built it. Okay, so with that analogy, we're going to follow that analogy all the way through and we're going to build on it. We're just going to see how would you think if you were God and you turned earth over to somebody to run. Now, is there an end time transfer of wealth? Point number two, James 5, 3 says this. Ye rich men have heaped treasure together for the last days. Most Christians would agree we're living in the last days. Now, what does it mean that the rich man has heaped treasure together for the last days? Very interesting word is the word together. If you look it up in Greek, you know what it means? Collection specifically Christian. So the rich man has heaped up treasure for a Christian collection for the last days. Why? Is God going to transfer the wealth from the sinner to the just? You have to decide that. You're the grand jury. You make the decision. What is the transfer of wealth? Is, is it right for God to take all the wealth and just give it to somebody who didn't work for it? Put that in the back of your mind and think about it as we go through this lesson. In the beginning, God gave man dominion over earth. Now in the text of the notes, it says this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He made man in his own image and after his own likeness and gave him dominion or stewardship over all the earth. That's in Genesis 1.26. God intended that the profit of earth benefit all men. Ecclesiastes 5.9. Solomon said that. But fallen men blinded by Satan, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and in a fallen state viewed earth and its wealth as a personal possession and not a stewardship from God. For nearly 6,000 years men have fought and warred over earth and its profit. 
It's in James 4.1. In human terms, God's ticked off. Unrighteous men have used earth, profit, and riches to enslave men rather than to serve men. Now, is that a reality? Shake your heads if you think it's a reality. You know it's a reality. Now, what would you do if people took charge of your corporation and made slaves of the people working in your company? What would you do? What would you do with the people who are running that business? Now, let's give God some credit. Let's just try to be practical and think this thing through. Proverbs 29, point number three says this. Proverbs 29, two. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. That's been true for nearly 6,000 years. Whenever righteous men are in authority, people are rejoicing. But when wicked men bear rule, then people mourn. Why? Because they're under oppression. Because the wicked use the, world, the riches of this earth to enslave men. What if there were men in your corporation doing that? How would you feel? What would you do about it? In the text, the Lord has been long-suffering but not slack. Hell is an eternal place of horror, and he does not want men to perish and go there, 2 Peter 3, 9. But we are approaching the end of time, and the reign of the unrighteous rich will cease. The transfer of their riches will be their opportunity to trust Christ. How about that? See, if God transfers the wealth, this is the last opportunity, I think, for a rich man to realize, hey, I've trusted my money all these years and it's been a waste, it's gone. Now, 1929 on the Wall Street crash, people just jumped off of buildings. I hope the next time this happens, they'll come to trust Christ as their Savior instead of doing something irrational. Hopefully, they will see the folly of having trusted money and will repent. God always does everything twice. He transferred the riches of Egypt to Israel. And will he once again transfer the wealth from the sinner to the just? Will he do that? That's what we want to try to find out. And you're the grand jury. I'm going to try to present some facts, and you're going to make a decision based on that. Now, put yourself in God's place. Who would you want ruling on earth? The righteous, who have the knowledge or the mind of Christ, or the wicked, who use the knowledge of the world. Page 2. Dominion requires the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5.1. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What is his mind? You know what his mind is? It's the mind of a servant because he humbled himself, became obedient, took upon him the form of his servant, was made in the likeness of man, humbled himself, and became obedient unto what? Death. There were no limits to his obedience. See, you and I place limits on our obedience. If we're to have the mind of Christ, there's no limits to the obedience. 1A, the mind of Christ is the mind of a servant. The text, a paradox of Christianity is Christ, the servant king. Mark 10, 45 says that the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to minister, not to serve, I mean, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. That one verse changed my view on Christianity. Why is that? When I saw Mark 10, 45, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, it changed my whole outlook. Why is that? Because the religions of the world have gods who demand service. Our God came to serve. Big difference. He now sits at the right hand of the Father, living just to intercede for you and me. Hebrews 7.25. And in eternity, he'll be serving us again. Ephesians 2.7. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, says Hebrews 13.8. He's the servant king. God in wisdom gives happiness and contentment and giving and not in getting. Why? Because he came to serve because that's where the contentment is. It's in service. Now, if God had created man to be happy in getting, God would have authored sin because men are continually fighting and warring to get what others have. Wise men, like their servant king, seek to serve. Fools want to be served. Now, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he came to serve, today he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. 
And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's he going to be doing in the future? Same thing. He's going to be serving. Why? Because that's his mind. Because he created man to be content in giving, not getting. You can't be content. I don't care how much you get. You know, I count, I've been counseling for about 25 years in finances. Counsel people making 50000 a year. They thought, oh, if I could just make 70000 I'd be happy. You counsel people making seventy. If I could just make 100000 I'd be happy. I've counseled people making a quarter of a million. They, if I could just make another 50000 I'd be happy. You can't. Because if God would have made man content in getting, God would have authored sin. Because for 6,000 years, men have fought. So let's put that you can't be happy in getting. You can only be happy in giving. God created that way. Now let's go to your business. What if you've got eight or ten departments in your business and everybody's fighting for control? What kind of business are you going to have? You're going to have a chaotic business. So what happens on earth if everybody's fighting for their piece of earth? Same thing. You're not going to put up with that in your business. How long do you think God's going to put up with it? Not too much longer. The mind of Christ is to be served. The mind of the unrighteous man is selfish. He wants riches for his own pleasure. Will God transfer the wealth to anyone who has the mindset of man? If you were running your business, would you turn it over? No, you wouldn't. James 5, 1 to 6 establishes the reality of the end time transfer of wealth. Now, circle the key word or words in each of the verses and relate them to the words to the right. Now, James 5, verse 1 says this, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Circle the word miseries. You have a number there. The number is 5004. To the right is that same number, and that's taken out of Strong's Concordance, and to the right is the definition of that word. The word misery comes from the Greek word talent. So what is the misery that the rich man is going to face? Financial miseries. Verse 2, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. And the word corrupted, 4595 in strong concordance, is the word perished. Rich men, your riches are perished. Now where did they go to? Verse 3, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You've heaped treasure together for the last days. The word cankered means sent down. The word rust means sending down. The word martyr, and I want you to circle those words. Circle cankered, rust, and witness. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Circle the word together. And look up here for just a moment. It says this. Gold and silver doesn't canker and it doesn't rust. And you know that. So what were the King James boys saying? I'll tell you what God was saying. Your gold and silver is sent down. And the sending down of it will be a martyr against you because that's what you've martyred your life for it. You've gave your whole life to making riches and you've martyred your life. Sure, your gold and silver is sent down and the sending them down shall be a martyr against you. You've heaped treasure for a Christian collection for the last days. Now, do I believe that? You're the grand jury. <laughs> Verse 4, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud. Cry it. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sebaot. The word Lord there is the word controller. Why? He's the controller of the currency. He's the, the gold and silver is his. It's not Satan. Satan's the god of this world. But he's not the god of earth. There's a big difference. And the word Sebaot is the word army an army prepared for battle. In other words, see, God's going to transfer the wealth. He's the controller of the currency. Planet Earth is his. The rich man have used it for themselves. And now God has a military that's going to come in, okay, and he's going to transfer the wealth. Now, verse 5 says to the rich man, you've lived in pleasure in the earth, 
and been wanton. You have nursed your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he never resisted you. Why? It wasn't time yet. Page 3. Christ's mind is to serve. 1. Luke 6.38 says this. Give, and it shall be given unto you. You see, because the way to get is to give. Because God made it that way. The way to get is to give. And we give to get to give. 1A. Serving is the key to life successes. Who do you want in Washington, D.C.? Politicians who are serving their own interest or yours? Do you want a president serving your interest or his? Do you want company running your business who are serving the interest of the business or their own interest? Do you want men in your company who are seeking their own career or the success of the company? Because if the company succeeds, then everybody succeeds. But if the company doesn't succeed, then nobody will because the company will go bankrupt. Now, play, peace and prosperity are in giving, not in getting. Life's successes come from serving. The man or business which best serves the needs, wants, and desires of others generally succeeds. Nature itself exists on giving, not getting. Lightning gives the ground nitrogen, which gives nutrition to the soil. Fertile soil gives life to the crops, which in turn give nutrition to man. Man sows seed in the earth, which produces food for man. God created the life to cycle and, repro and reproduce in giving, not in getting. When getting replaces giving, fights and start and wars follow. When man's mind is focused on getting, men, nations, and nature rebels and chaos reigns. In coming as a servant, Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, gives an example to follow to gain peace and prosperity. But unrighteous men, seeking to enrich themselves, have defrauded the laborers before Christ's second advent. Will he return to the laborers, the wages stolen by the rich? Will he do it? A warning to the rich man, James 5, 1 to 6. You have a pictorial. At the pop, top, and that pictorial is a man thinking. In, and there's a line, a number one there. I want you to write the word miseries. There, miseries. Now, what are the miseries? Number two, they're perished because he's taking them. Number three, what happens to them? They're sent down. Number three, they're sent down. Why are they sent down? Number four, because the rich man has martyred his life for the money. He's not served God, he served money. Number five, what is it sent down for? A Christian collection. And number six, who's going to reinforce this, correction, this Christian collection? The controller of the armies. Page four. Righteous service preserves dominion. Who does God want running his business? Who do you want running your business? Do you want man thinking with the mind of your son? If you were God, or do you want my men running your business who are thinking with their own mind? What do you want? Let's be fair with God, okay? Now, one, Jesus made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of his servant. Philippians 2, 7. What's the key to life? Now, if you go on in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Christ set aside his reputation. 1A, Christ set aside his reputation. Why are we trying to build ours? I mean, we, uh, an awful lot of things that we do, we do for reputation, don't we? He set his aside. We're trying to build ours. So you know what he's got to do? He's got to take it down in order to build it up. The text, happiness is in giving, not getting. If men really understood and believed that the Christ life really worked, life on earth would be different. God ordained that happiness, health, wealth, honor, and peace would result from giving and serving, not from getting and being served. Solomon, with all his wealth, tried to grasp happiness from things and discovered that it was vanity. It vexed the human spirit and was totally unprofitable. Ecclesiastes 2.11. Our lack of knowledge of this fact results in our failures. We can't gain happiness by getting things. If we could, God would have authored sin. 
Men have stubbornly rejected God's knowledge and fought and warred to get what others have, but have not achieved happiness. If we reject God's knowledge, God will reject us. God cannot go against his own design and order, and he doesn't make any exceptions, not even for you and me. In Westminster Abbey, on the grave of Christopher Chapman, you understand, this is back like in 1680. On this tombstone are the words, What I gave, I have. What I spent, I lost by not giving it. Isn't that true? Now, Christopher Chapman was in heaven, been in heaven for over 320 years, and that's what he said. What I gave, I have. What I spent, I had. What I left, I lost by not giving it. The end time transfer of wealth, number one at the bottom of the page. God will transfer the wealth, will he? James 5, 3 says this, ye rich men have heaped treasure for a Christian collection for the last days. Number two, we can be a part of the transfer. Philippi how? Philippians 2, 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Number three, we must be committed to God's covenant. Deuteronomy 8, 18 at the bottom of the page says this, God giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. The whole reason God gives wealth and it says in Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get a wealth, that he may establish his covenant, not my career, not my lifestyle. Now, my lifestyle and my career is going to get better as a spillover. But the purpose is his covenant, not my career. Now, let's go back to the, where we started. God created the heavens and the earth. You created your business. Who do you want running your business? Who does God want running his earth? Does he want men who, with their own mindset or his mindset? Do you want men running your business with your mindset or their own mindset? Just think about it. And what do you want men doing? You want them serving. Because if everybody serves the corporation, the corporation can do very well. If everybody served each other here on earth, we'd do well. See, God's not going to take the wealth and give it to us just because we're Christians. We say, well, the rich have had it long enough. It's about time for them to give it to us. No, that's not it. It doesn't work that way. God's not that way. He's looking for good stewards. We can be one, can't we?